origins of soil science, the evolution of our discipline, and finally, some ideas about the future of the discipline. Most people consider the founder of soil science to be uh, Vasily Dukachayev, a Russian. And I think uh, that statue of Dukachayev in Kamenaya Steppe, Russia, is the only statue I know of to a soil scientist. He was a geographer in the late 1800s, sent to the steppe to study drought, because drought led to famine. And so he led an expedition of 39 scientists. It was very diverse. He's a geographer by training. There are meteorologists, geologists, um, foresters, hydrologists, and their task was to try and understand what caused the drought and um, to end the droughts and end the famine. I won't go into what they discovered and uh, what practices they recommended, but it was important to note that this expedition and others were the beginnings of soil science because what Dokochaya strongly stressed was the need to understand how soils formed, why they were located and the properties were different from place to place and how that affected the things like drought, the ability to grow crops or you know, forests. So in the early uh, 20th century, the science of pedology was created. And pedology has to do with the formation of soils. In fact, Dokochayev is known as the father or the founder of genetic pedology, which means the genesis of soils. So the whole discipline was about how soils form and what their functions were. And so pedology was the central part, the focus. And it, it drew from other sciences, the um, physical sciences, the biological sciences, fundamental sciences, and the applied scientists, including forestry, um, agronomy, soil fertility, basically what we would know as cultivated agriculture. So through the most part of the 20th century, um, programs of study were created around the world, including the United States, um, with this focus strongly on pedology, how soils were formed and uh, how the uh, different uh, soil forming factors resulted in the quality of the soil and its ability to do what humans needed it to do at that location. So in the, in the middle part of the 20th century, departments of soil science were created in many places. In the United States, there were perhaps 20 different land grant universities, agricultural universities that had an independent soil science department. And these departments also had specializations in physics, pedology, chemistry, and biology. And then over time, in the second half of the 20th century, many subdisciplines and specializations were developed. I like the characterization that the philosopher of science Ian Hacking gives to uh, specializations that it's Darwinian selection. So the ones that survive are the ones that have the most interest and most support. But the downside of specialization is that they are often mutually incomprehensible to each other. And that certainly happened in soil science. Someone who is trained in the latter half of the 20th century in soil microbiology may have a degree that had no preparation in pedology, physics, or chemistry. And so what was lost was that connection to the foundational element of soil science, which is how soils were formed, why they're distributed the way they were. So a soil microbiologist might not have any knowledge of those factors. And I'm not picking on microbiologists out there. It's just an example of how those subdisciplines became so distinct that they, they were really separated from the foundational aspect of the science. And this included journals that uh, many of these subdisciplines had their own separate journals uh, or that developed over time. And so not only were they um, not studying some of the foundational elements of soil science, they were actually publishing in journals separate separately from the science. This led to good collaboration with uh, other fields, but unfortunately it grew a distance between uh, soil science 
per se and these specializations. So what's the future now? Well, um, right now there's one soil science department left in the United States and it's now um, likely to be merged with another department in the next few years. So as a unique discipline and an independent department or field of study at, at universities in the United States, soil science is gone. It's disappeared. However, what's happened is there are now new relationships with other fields through these specializations. And notice, notice that the arrows are going in both directions now. Science is not informing soil science as it was early in the 20th century. Now soil science in these sub-disciplines has more of an interaction with these other disciplines. A good example is soil physics with hydrology. Many soil physicists are also member of the American Geophysical Union, and it's because of their interest in water flow in soils and hydrology. And so hydrologists are, are becoming more active in soils and soil scientists are working more in hydrology. So there's a much, um, I think, stronger exchange between different uh, fields of science and engineering. Uh, another uh, interesting thing is that there's a lot of work recently in soils and human health. So there, there's um, interest in medicine, in uh, psychology. We have soil scientists who have designed measurements that have been taken place on Mars. So they're also involved in space exploration. So these, there's sort of uh, in the last few years, this sort of blossoming of a lot of different applications of soil science, even though the discipline itself has virtually disappeared from the United States and also uh, many other countries. In fact, there was a book chapter, I just saw the PDF proofs of it yesterday, looking at how soil science is now taught across the world. And it's not alone in the US that it's essentially disappearing as an independent field of study, university department, for instance. However, more and more people are being trained in soils, even though it's more often in one of the sub-disciplines and how that relates to these new fields of study or interaction. So to summarize, um, soil science developed as a separate academic discipline early in the 20th century, and it, has, it was informed by these basic earth and biological sciences. Many of our early soil scientists were trained in other disciplines. They applied that training in the field of soil science, many times in physics, chemistry, biology, the basic sciences. Soil science is a separate field of study and instruction uh, was common throughout most of the 20th century with multiple areas of specialization. And then finally, as a distinct academic discipline, it's basically now disappearing. Um, however, its stature, its uh, visibility as a science is, is increasing at the same time. And that's some sort of paradoxically, it's like we don't identify so much with uh, university departments or the title of soil scientist. And yet many of these people uh, active in soils are doing a lot of this really cutting edge and interesting work for the time being. So um, that's my real brief perspective um, on the history of my discipline, a very high altitude perspective. And I'll stop sharing at this point. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. That was really interesting. Um, as I say, um, we'll save the questions to the end. If you have questions, please can you pop them in the Q&A uh, session? If you look down the bottom of your screen, if you move the mouse around a little bit, you should see Q&A. And if you put your questions in there, um, I will direct them to the appropriate speaker. Um, so our next speaker is Professor Anne-Marie Jackson, also at Otago, where I am, and she's an Indigenous person from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Anne-Marie. Tina koe e Hamish, ara tina koto katoa, ko a fakaro i ka mai i raro i te nei karanga kaupapa o tato. Thank you, Hamish, and to my fellow 
panel members and also to those who are watching or tuning in from around the globe. Ko Anne Marie Jackson talking what? My name is Anne Marie. He Māori aho, no Aotearoa. So I am an Indigenous person from, as Hamish said, from Aotearoa, New Zealand. No ngā iwi o Ngāti Whātua, ngā pui, ngāti wai, me ngāti kahu o Whangaroa. Now I'm from a number of the different tribes in the Northern Island of New Zealand, from Auckland North. He mihi anō tēnei ki ngā iwi takitaki o te ao, a tēnā koutou mi o koutou whenua o koutou maunga o koutou awa i raro i tēnei kaupapo tato. Also pay acknowledgement to other Indigenous peoples who are involved in this gathering, as well as those who are from other nations as we are gathered here, and an acknowledgement to our ancestors past, present and future in the work that we do. I utilise our my native tongue or our Indigenous language, te reo Māori, as it is the framing from which how I see the world and how many other Indigenous peoples around the world collectively see the world also. I've titled out my presentation today, Indigenous Science or for Flourishing Wellbeing. So I sit in one of the world firsts, as the director of one of the world's first centres of Indigenous science, uh, with the hope and aspiration of becoming a department, as well as a unique centre of studying this thing called Indigenous science. I have another role as well as a national centre, as a director of one of the national centres of research excellence in New Zealand, which are large collaborations, large collaborative research efforts within our New Zealand research landscape focused, and that's called Coastal People Southern Skies, which is focused on understanding the impacts of climate change on coastal communities for flourishing well-being. The pictures that you can see here and a number of the pictures that you'll see throughout, I want to pay recognition to one of my nephews who is a local artist, Keanu Townsend, and you'll see some of his artwork throughout. On the left-hand side of the screen, this is one of our traditional ancestral meeting houses, which is where I come from. And I'll come back to this uh, in one of the ideals of DHST. This is called Te Hauhanga Arongo, or it is in that this building was actually created over a hundred years ago in a recognition of a peacemaking activity between two warring tribes at the time. The middle you can see here is one of the ancestral landscapes that I have a genealogical connection to, one of our rivers of importance in the northern Wairoa, which then leads, it's one of the, that is the largest tributary into one of the largest natural harbours in the southern hemisphere, the Kaipara Harbour, Kaipara Moana, and then the next one across is my family actually and myself in reconnecting to our ancestral practices or the purposes of building, carving, sailing, traditional voyaging canoes. And this is in a lake in the far north of New Zealand as well. And this picture here in particular, that'll be the first time in over 800 years that a canoe of this type has been returned into these lakes. What I wanted to share today is an exploration into this, our early work that we're doing around positioning Indigenous science and the importance of this for flourishing well-being, really drawing on the theme for the gathering or the hui, as we would call it in Aotearoa, and thinking about what are some of the future, future potentials or perspectives that DHST could move in, and really interested as well as, well as an Indigenous person in exploring some of the ideals and how there are synergies across the three ideals of internationalization, peace, and then also finally how I've interpreted anyway, our diverse uniqueness, but also for a collective focus. So as an indigenous person, we are found across the globe. Of course, we sit in an interesting context today within a modern world of within our systems and structures that privilege certain ways of knowing over others. For us, for myself as an Indigenous person from Aotearoa, we do have a unique way of how we see the world and how 
critically for us is our worldview. And so how we, and that's certainly shared across many indigenous peoples across the globe, that we have our own unique ways of thinking about the world. There are shared aspects, but of course we are very unique in our own way. Indigenous science, how I define Indigenous science is the study of Indigenous people's relationship and observation of the natural world based on Indigenous worldviews, values, cultures and language. Indigenous peoples are first peoples with unique and distinct worldviews, cultures, practices and languages. Our natural world is often seen as a living, breathing ancestor in a more senior hierarchical relationship to humans. The relationship and observation of the natural world as an ancestor is generally mediated through the spirit, is generally mediated through the spiritual realm and the spiritual essence of the natural world. In many instances, these spiritual relationships begin with our unique creation narratives and origins that then give rise to a set of values. And these values govern our relationships and observations of the natural world. And these are specific to the context. Indigenous science, like indigenous peoples, are constantly evolving. We, are a const we also have a constantly evolving knowledge system that has adapted over time and continues to adapt. In Aotearoa, and within a Southern New Zealand context, Indigenous science is explicitly mātauranga, or Māori knowledge. It's also defined by our social structure to the, tri to the tribe, the sub-tribe, and the family. Well, the family, a collection of families is called the sub-tribe. Multiple sub-tribes is then the tribe, which is our main, our primary social structure. And so to come, the many of the major issues that are facing the world by shift primarily to climate change, Indigenous peoples have a long history of observation of our natural world. And often our voices and our ways of understanding the world are not included, whether that's at a local level, at a national level, and certainly in an international level. And so my work through one of the Māori, or our Indigenous Centres of Research Excellence, is about indigenizing our world and certainly the academy. So this point or this ideal around internationalization is the focus that we have as Māori, as Indigenous peoples, and in ensuring that we are connected with our Indigenous brothers and sisters across the world as we undertake the various kaupapa or the various research that we may have in order to significantly transform the world that we're in for flourishing well-being, not only for Indigenous peoples, but also for all peoples who inhabit the globe. Uh, the second point uh, in relation to the importance of understanding peace, Indigenous peoples have, we have our unique ways of thinking about our own peacemaking traditions. And I think that that is an, an, an exciting area that DHST can also continue to focus in on what are Indigenous people's perspectives of peace and peacemaking. Within New Zealand, we very much have a, a constitutional treaty here, which is one of the which is one of the primary constitutional documents of Aotearoa. And finally, our in looking at this understanding of a collective focus or the diverse uniqueness that we have for a collective focus as Indigenous peoples through our shared histories, not only in relationship to colonisation, but in relationship to each other, means that we have a collective voice of wanting to significantly transform the systems and the structures that we're within, but also to support the flourishing wellness for our peoples, as I said at the beginning, for past, present and future. And what I wanted to conclude on as I am watching the time here, as well is one of the very exciting things that, that we're doing that I'm proud to share is we are right, currently writing an Indigenous science curriculum that we hope that all students who enroll at the University of Otago have the opportunity to undertake a major in Indigenous science in the undergraduate degree program. 
and then into the postgraduate degree program as well. So all students, all science students can have the opportunity to learn and to understand what Indigenous peoples means. And that's, that is one, uh, what Indigenous science means, not only for the benefit for Indigenous peoples and the issues that, that we face, but also the issues that are faced more broadly and globally as well. Noreda. So to conclude, thank you very much for listening and for the opportunity to be here. Um, I would like to conclude with a short prayer, uh, which recognizes the importance of my own cultural background, but also the topic at hand as well, and for the hui here today, or the gathering here today. And that final prayer, which is the last picture that my nephew has done or drawn um, here, it speaks about, again, where I come from, the importance of understanding our worldview our cultural perceptions about the world so that we can lead flourishing lives. Kia ora, thank you. Kia ora, Anne-Marie. Thank you very much for um, your contribution today. Um, can I remind people if they have questions, and I'm sure there will be questions um, from uh, for our speakers, if they could pop those into the Q&A chat box that's down the bottom of your screen. Our uh, next speaker is John Steele, who is a professor of Egyptology and Assyriology at Brown University, and he's going to talk to us about does ancient science have a future? John. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here to, to tell you something about uh, the uh, what I hope uh, will be the future of ancient, the study of ancient science. Uh, I am here as a representative of the Commission for the History of Ancient and Medieval Astronomy, um, which is one of the um, um, important institutional uh, homes for the study of, of ancient science. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm glad that I'm able to represent them here today. As I'm sure many people are aware, Within the academic world of the history of science, the history of ancient science is, in a sense, one of the oldest aspects uh, of study. Uh, you, we can trace this back uh, several hundred years. Um, but in more recent times, it has been a, a field that has become less and less prominent within the broader history of science, I would say. Um, so what I want to talk about is a little bit about uh, how I think that ancient science is, is once more uh, becoming more uh, relevant to broader history of science questions, uh, and also what I think its future uh, development could be and hopefully will be uh, along these lines that will again see a, uh, an, uh, uh, an increasing uh, integration within broader history of, of science. So in terms of the future of history of science, I want to break this down, the history of ancient science, I want to break this down into two areas. Uh, one is the sort of the intellectual uh, future. Uh, what are people doing now that is uh, bringing the history of ancient science forward? Um, but also the institutional uh, future. Does history of science have an history of ancient science have an institutional future? And if so, what is that future? Um, so let me begin with the intellectual. I think one thing that uh, is perhaps still surprising to a lot of people uh, is that the study of ancient science is still working on a lot of new material. Uh, we are still recovering a lot of uh, material from new sources, whether this being from new archaeological explorations, uh, from um, uh, material that is uh, discovered in, in, in museum collections that are, or libraries that have previously not been identified, uh, and so forth. So this is still a, a, an increase in our source material. Um, so, as I say, we have new discoveries. Some of this uh, new material, though, is also coming about through technological developments. Um, so the study of ancient science has benefited hugely from developments in imaging technology over the past uh, couple of decades. Um, so just to give you an example, um, one of the probably, probably the, the most well-known astronomer of 
uh, of the ancient world, at least in, in the ancient Western world, Claudius Ptolemy from the second century uh, AD, the Greek astronomer, only last year, uh, a new text by him was discovered in a palimpsest uh, that was uh, became readable through the development of imaging technology. Um, so there is still new material that's going to come about uh, that uh, both from new discoveries and from improvements, technological improvements in imaging uh, and so forth, it's allowing us to read texts that were previously uh, unknown or unreadable to us. But the other way that we're developing or, or people are working on new sources is I think the field of ancient science has broadened its concept of what is science and what constitutes a scientific source. So people are very much now looking beyond um, what used to be thought of as the, the real scientific texts into texts that are evidence of scientific practice um, that maybe that include evidence about uh, the science itself. So for example, within the history of mathematics, there are fields of people working on accounting texts and so forth that are giving insights into numeracy, the way that um, popular numeracy relates to uh, scholarly mathematics, and so forth in the ancient world. So there's been a much broadening outside of the sort of traditional view of what is ancient science, what's an ancient scientific text to a much wider range of material that people are interested in now. The other uh, broadening of course, is into the, the cultures and languages in which texts are, are being studied. Um, now this of course happened uh, really over the past uh, 100 years or so in terms of the academic discipline of history of science um, with historians of science uh, predominantly, and I'm talking here predominantly about European and, and North American uh, historians of science working on material from India, working on material from China, working on material from the East Asian, uh, uh, East Asia, and so forth. And, and also now uh, people working on material from Africa uh, and, uh, and beyond. So I think there's been a broadening of our sources also into languages uh, and cultures that were previously not really being considered uh, by historians of, of science. And then the, the third thing is, is also a sense of going beyond texts. People are now starting to look at other material uh, in quite a detailed way. So preserved instruments, uh, iconography, visual evidence, uh, and so forth um, uh, that is beyond the written record. And this again is a new kind of development, I would say over the past, um, past half century uh, that's really taken off in the past 10 years or so that's broadening out our approaches to the, to the ancient material. Nevertheless, the, the continued uh, discovery of this, this new material and the broadening of, of our sort of range of material still requires the sort of fundamental work that a lot of ancient historians of ancient science do, which is producing editions of texts, translating texts, writing commentaries. So the kind of the, the unglamorous, but actually absolutely essential work uh, of actually understanding these, these texts uh, is still very much ongoing. Um, despite the kind of the intellect, the institutional um, uh, obstacles to doing so, uh, producing an edition of an ancient scientific text is not the thing that's going to get your tenure in a university or get you promoted in the same way as a synthetic book that's published by Cambridge University Press is going to. So there is a, a, an obstacle to this sort of essential work uh, that, that we must overcome. But alongside the new sources, I think there's also been a development in the past uh, decade or so of, of many new approaches and questions that historians of ancient science are, are asking that I suspect echo much more with the type of questions that historians of more recent science are also asking. One uh, major new approach, I would say, I mean, it's not a new approach, but is, is considering um, uh, the history of uh, early science in a, from a much more global perspective. Now, I think up until fairly recently, there were people working on history of uh, early science in all parts of the world, um, but these weren't often in communication with one another. So there was a large group of scholars, for example, working on astronomy in East Asia, or mathematics in East Asia, and there were a large group of scholars working on, on astronomy and mathematics and science in India. But many times those scholars were not part of the same community, not 
publishing in the same journals, not meeting at the same conferences, as scholars working on, for example, Greek uh, science or Arabic science uh, or, um, or, or medieval European science. I think that is starting to shift. There is a much more crossover, much more dialogue between scholars who are working on uh, different parts of, uh, of the world. Um, and also, I'm happy to say, branching out from the old world into scholars working on uh, uh, in, in the Americas, on, on uh, indigenous knowledge in the Americas, in uh, uh, material from Africa and from, uh, from Australasia. This is starting to become part of the discussions that historians of ancient science have in a way that it wasn't uh, 10 or 20 years ago. Another approach that is, is fairly new that I think is, uh, is uh, important is I think there's been a, a, a focus more recently on, on the practice of science and on scientific practitioners rather than on um, sort of highbrow scientific theory, uh, but actually on what are people are actually doing? What are people doing when they're making astronomical observation in the ancient world? What are people doing when they're calculating uh, a long division in, uh, in, in a particular context? Who are doing this? What type of things are these? Who are these people? What else are they doing? What is their institutional context? So there's been a much more greater focus on that, I think, over the past uh, couple of decades that I can see only continuing uh, in the future. Another focus, uh, 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 another new approach and, and research questions are around the materiality of texts and objects uh, of science from the ancient world. Um, so what are these texts written on? Why are they formatted in certain ways and so forth? And then a, a, another thing that's really just, I would say in the last decade or so, is the, uh, looking at visual evidence of ancient science. What is the iconography uh, telling us about the conceptions of constellations in the history of astronomy? Or what does the uh, um, uh, decoration on a water clock tell us about the use of that piece of technology? So that's another approach I say that's really, I would say, just starting up in the last, in, within the last decade. And I think this is all part of a, of a move towards something that we don't have a good name for in the history of science and certainly not in the history of ancient science, but I sort of call holistic histories. That is histories that are trying to um, uh, tell a, a complete picture of science as a, a social activity and practice um, that combines the technical with the uh, cultural in, in, a, in a completely uh, enmeshed way. So not just studying science in context, but trying to actually understand the whole thing as one complete package. So let me look uh, then at the future in terms of the institutional. So let me just say a little bit about where are people, where were the academic homes of people working on the history of ancient science? Well, with only a small number of exceptions, they are mostly not in history of science or STS departments. Uh, up until recently, there have been very few history of science departments that have employed a historian of ancient science. I'm happy to say that's starting to change. There were within the last couple of years, there have been several history of science programs that have advertised for historians of ancient science. But in general, particularly in North America, STS departments are very modern focused. So there's really not been an institutional home for historians of early science in, in those departments. Most of us, therefore, are actually based in area studies departments. So in classics, in Egyptology, in East Asian studies, Assyriology departments, Middle Eastern studies departments. Uh, that's where most of us are based. Uh, and I think that also um, has consequences for how we undertake our, our research because we're also speaking to those audiences. And then a few are also based in uh, science departments. This is particularly true of people working on history of mathematics. There are many historians of mathematics who are based and employed as mathematicians in, in mathematics departments in universities. One very positive development, however, that I would say in the last uh, few years has been a, a real uh, uh, sea change in the funding of ancient science, uh, particularly in Europe through the ERC. So there have been many, uh, quite a few major uh, uh, research projects employing a lot of postdocs and, and, and training students. So funded by the ERC, the European Research Council. So I'm thinking of things like the Alpha project on Alphonsine astronomy, uh, the Zodiac project at Berlin on the transmission of um, the concept of the Zodiac and mathematical astronomy across the ancient world. 
uh, a project in Paris on the sciences of the ancient world, a project on Ptolemy and its legacy and his legacy in, in Munich and so forth. There are also big projects that have been funded in other parts of the ancient world, in other parts of the world. So, for example, in China, the various projects associated with the Silk Road um, uh, kind of umbrella have also really increased the amount of people working and able to work, increased the visibility in the, in the, in the scholarship of the history of ancient science. In terms of uh, uh, conferences and where people are presenting, uh, I would say that um, we are at a mixture of uh, um, presenting at history of science conferences, although this is very regional. So, for example, in North America, you will find almost no historians of ancient science at the big history of science conference. And this is just this is not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just the way it is uh, and the way it's been for a long time. Um, I don't know whether this has started out with historians of ancient science not being welcome or whether it was historians of science thinking they would get nothing there, but it's an institutional uh, uh, fact that is going to take a long time to change. So most of work on the history of ancient science is, is uh, uh, discussed with colleagues either at uh, area focus co um, uh, conferences, so I speak at seriology conferences or classics conferences or Chinese studies conferences, these type of places, or much more now I would say it's specialist conferences of people working on a particular topic, often associated with these funded projects. So again, I think that's a, a, uh, there's a good potential here for trying to broaden our reach of, of speaking opportunities for historians of ancient science at conferences. And just finally, to end on a positive note, uh, with the recruitment of students and the training of students in the history of ancient science, I think there's been quite an upturn in interest amongst both undergraduates and PhD students in ancient science in the past uh, few years. Um, and so I think there's, there's a healthy trajectory there. The real challenge is going to be finding jobs for all these people, as it is in all fields. Uh, but I think in, in terms of uh, in terms of interest among students, there is interest in ancient science again in a way that maybe wasn't 20 or 30 years ago when I was uh, starting my career. Um, so I think there's, there's definitely positive developments there. Uh, so I'll finish there. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to tell you something about how I think that uh, ancient science can kind of reintegrate and, and look forward uh, into the broader history of science community. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, I just would encourage people to put their uh, questions into the Q and A box down the bottom of the screen. There, um, I have I have one question already from Marcos Cueto that I'm going to direct to the um, the three speakers because it actually wants all three of you to respond to it. Um, and uh, uh, but we'll do it in the order in which you spoke. So we'll go Tom and then Emery, then John. And, and Marcus's question is, um, how do you get graduate students interested in developing a career in your field? That's an excellent question because as I mentioned in my, my talk that independent departments of soil science in many cases, programs of studies have all but disappeared. So um, that's sort of the, the formal downside. The upshot though, and the positive side is we still get students very interested in studying soils, but they don't like the sort of rigid traditional manner in which soils had been taught in the past. So uh, they come in with interest in, in things like environmental science is a, a good example. So they're very interested in environmental science. They're interested in the soils aspect of it. So the challenge is to develop a program of study that meets university requirements, but doesn't sort of overburden the student with a lot of the more traditional aspects of the science, which they're not interested in. They're interested in the applying soil science to environmental science, and they're not interested in some of the, in a good example is the agricultural aspects. So they see a clear distinction there. They want one and not the other. Hmm. There are careers for them. They're, you know, they're virtually 100% placement, the university I'm at. So there are jobs out there for them. Um, and it, the, the challenge is, I think, is updating university curriculums to reflect the reality of the student interest and the job market. Thanks, Tom. And Marie. Yeah, I really agree with the last part of your statement there as well. Uh, which is what I was yeah, laughing about, actually. 
yeah the yeah the need I mean in New Zealand it's really interesting we um we have a, a number of major reforms that are going on at the moment and one of those reforms is in the high school the secondary school curriculum so where indigenous knowledge now is will be becoming a requirement across all subject areas in our school and curriculum and then really at the moment our university systems are not currently geared up for those future students to get to get to us and so if that's part of a big drive of what we're in our work and at the moment how graduate students get to us sometimes it's really by luck um, if they can arrive at us because of the lack of indigenous content and curriculum that exists across a number of the different degree programs but the wonderful thing is is that there's a real there's also a major reform going on or it's actually gone through big changes around the funding landscape so many funding rounds now has to have a focus around things Maori or things indigenous and so we're kind of in this little catch-22 a little bit where Often graduate students would have had very little undergraduate training in relation to any research or content related to things Indigenous and are having to really do undergraduate related content at the beginning of their graduate programs. And so that's quite the space that we sit within is we have these really wonderful Indigenous and non-Indigenous graduate students who partly by chance and also some of our own recruitment have arrived to us. But the exciting part is, is as we can piece the pipeline, I suppose, together from the schooling system up into tertiary, increase our, increase our capability and capacity, increase the numbers of academic staff who can then teach on the content. And then there will be, again, graduates who could study Indigenous science, but also any area of study that would say be at the interface or also those that those different areas of study that are not indigenous derived or from indigenous worldviews but certainly that indigenous peoples have an interest in um, for the particular issues that are in front of them thank you Anne-Marie um John uh thank you it, it's uh I think that uh, we face some of the same type of challenges um, uh, that have already been mentioned uh, in the study of ancient science. Most people who come into the history of ancient science are coming from one of two backgrounds. They are either coming in from a science training uh, or else they are coming in from an ancient history training uh, and a language training. And really what we have to do with uh, in both cases is we have to teach the other discipline. So I, you know, if I, I get students coming in who have a strong science background and I have to teach them ancient languages, or I get students coming in who have the languages and I have to teach them the astronomy and the mathematics. Um, and so that's uh, always a challenge, um, but it's doable. Um, I would say that it's very rare that I get a student coming in who has a background in history of science, a formal background, um, in terms of having done history of science as an undergraduate. Um, they are tending to come in as they from science or from uh, from you know classics or East Asian studies or something like that. I think that one positive development that's happened recently is that funding in ancient science, because of the uh, of all these big projects, uh, has become easier for graduate students. Um, so there are more opportunities for graduate students to uh, get funding to do work in ancient science because of these ERC funded projects um, than there were uh, say 10 or 15 years ago. Um, I mean, there's always been some possibilities in the United States, but in Europe and the UK where I'm from, it was very difficult to get funding for history of ancient science as a PhD. And so I think there's money, there's more scope there. So that's a definitely a, a positive development uh, that we can hopefully will continue as it's opening up more, more possibilities for people. Thank you, John. I could, I saw Anne Marie nodding away there um, about when you were saying, John, about uh, how you had to teach the the other discipline that was there. Anne Marie, did you want to comment on that? You looked like you had something to say there. Yes, I was actually just me half messaging you in the chat, Hamish, if I could ask a question. Um, 
John, and you might have insight as well, Tom, how, how do you find that interface? Like That's something I really struggle with sometimes is how can you give, kind of be able to give like what is required in both. So I'll have, yeah, like around Indigenous knowledge, et cetera, and then also my discipline focus or additional discipline focus. And sometimes you feel like, are you doing justice to both or how do you find in that interface space? It's very challenging. Uh, I think it's easier for me because I'm teaching in, a, in the United States where we have two years of coursework at the PhD level, uh, which gives time to do this. Uh, in you know in, in the UK or in Europe, for example, where you don't have the coursework, it's very difficult. Um, but even so, even with the time for the coursework, it's hard to uh, it's hard to create that synergy, I think, between the two aspects of the of the work. and to, and it's hard to identify in advanced students who are going to have the capability to do both aspects. Um, it's not saying that you have to be an expert in in both. I mean, you don't you can do a lot of work if you're, you know, if you're okay with the language, you don't have to be a, an expert in the language and vice versa with the with the science. Um, but even with still identifying the students who have the, the potential to be able to do that is, is quite challenging. Um, and knowing quite how to how to train them so they understand the kind of when to when to place the emphasis on which side, you know, to 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 think both as a scientist and as a humanist, to think to, to treat evidence you know, not play fast and loose with the evidence, but also not get too caught up in crazy statistics. You know, this type of thing as well is also a challenge that I think uh, that we have to uh, also deal with. And it's, yeah, I, I haven't found a good solution. I think it's more of a just, you try and muddle through with each particular student and hopefully it works out in the end. And usually it does, but there's no recipe for how you do this in my word, in my opinion. This okay. discussion reminds me of many uh, committee meetings that I've had with graduate students over the years, where you go through strengths and weaknesses and the committee sits and says, well, you know, we really think they need more in this area. Or, and, and this is the unique aspect of students and what students bring. Uh, sometimes they are so perceptive and so adaptable. You're like, you know, they don't have formal training, but they're going to be fine because they just have skill. They can yeah. do it. It's it's amazing sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. I, it's many students I find have been like that. They, they come in with nothing and they just do it. <laughs> okay, I, I have a completely different question. Um, this one is aimed at uh, John and it's from Hugh Slotten who asks, why do you think there seems to be more interest in ancient science in Europe? Is it to do with the funding through the ERC? And then he asks a question that I think will be interesting to everybody is, are there broader implications from this for how different parts of the world approach history of science? So history of science more broadly. So there's a specific bit about ancient science in Europe and funding, and then a broader bit. I mean, I think partly it is funding. It's the institutional aspects that, um, I mean, it's very difficult to get funding for a history of science project from the NSF in the United States, for example. Um, um, uh, it's almost impossible to get uh, a project funded. And even if you do, the funding limitations are so low that you can't even employ a postdoc on them for more than, you know, you can have one postdoc for a year and a half or something. That's that's as much as you can do. Um, so I think that is a, a factor. I think it's also a factor of the, the kind of the critical mass of people at the who are employed in university departments doing history of ancient science. Um, so you do in Europe have some departments with, you know, small groups of people working on this, which forms a you know a critical mass. In North America, um, it's very much individuals spread out, one person at each at one particular university, and I think that also creates obstacles. Um, so yeah, but I think I think the funding is a big thing. I think the 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 ability to run these big projects in Europe uh, is really um, drawing a lot of people to Europe. Uh, as well, um, uh, and I think that's that, which is it is not what's there in in some other parts of the world. And this is yeah, it's going to cause problems in the future. I think this uh, of not having an even distribution of people uh, throughout the world and equal opportunity for people from different uh, areas to participate in this because of visa issues and things like that. Thank you, John. Um, I have a question here for Anne Marie. 
um, from Gordon McQuart, who says he is writing from Canada, where a Federal Truth and Recognition Commission has called for decolonizing science and taking Indigenous knowledge seriously. We're having some success in that, but in the midst we face the danger of essentializing Indigenous knowledge as one thing standing in counter-distinction to some other essential thing called science, which grates against STS, HPS woes about essentialism in general. How is New Zealand addressing this issue and bringing Indigenous voices into the discussion. Anne-Marie. Yeah, that's a great question. And we're having the same conversations here. I think, firstly, the importance of the acceptance of Indigenous knowledge and that it is taken seriously is really critical. Uh, there are still many pockets within Aotearoa and, and the world where Indigenous science is not seen as valid and as important. So I think that's important. I think that's critical. I definitely agree with the issues of essentialism. I think that where there can be in a, a really, and if I come back to the, you know, to that last ideal, uh, to a really around it is Indigenous peoples, and certainly within the specific context or the nation contexts, there's so much diversity as well of Indigenous peoples' views and understandings, even so for myself as Māori, within Māori from where I come from and compared to others, we have so much uniqueness and differences. So there are shared things that are similar, but the essentialism route it is can be quite challenging, definitely. I think that probably the uh, part of it's the philosophical underpinnings and the work that's required to really deeply think around what these notions of Indigenous science are. Some would challenge that decolonizing science and the project, I suppose, of decolonization also has a number of challenges as well uh, with it. Um, and kind of similar to the our discussion before around that interface work too can be can bring other issues. But probably lastly that I would say is in the, the last part of the question, how is New Zealand addressing the issue and bringing Indigenous voices into the discussion? I think there's been a huge change, a really big shift, and we'll say it quite often. So nothing about us without us. So the importance of having Indigenous peoples in the room and also across all areas of the leadership structure of whatever it might be. And then where things are entering into, so like myself, I could be in a conversation as an Indigenous person. So those conversations, or as a researcher, those conversations are quite different if they're in the more formalized nation to nation, institution to an indigenous nation. So ensuring that the level of which those voices are at are important. So if they're if it's at a federal level, then ensuring that the same, we talk about mana, or the same power and authority of those indigenous people is met um, on both sides in terms of the partnership and that those things are right from the ground up as well as the top down. Thank you, Anne-Marie. I um, was just checking for questions in, in other places. I actually have a question for, for Tom, which um, he said something right at the beginning, which really surprised me about the different um, national science soil science associations having to have some history of science component to them. Um, I, 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 I don't know whether that's unique or, um, or also how effective you think it might have been. Um, well, you know, I, I can only speak from the few countries that, that I'm aware of. I actually was an officer in the Soil Science Society of America, this, the history, philosophy, and sociology of soil science. It's not particularly active. Um, however, uh, usually it comes into play when there are, for instance, anniversaries or perhaps the passing of an outstanding scientist or retirement of a scientist. Very, that very often there is a um, sort of a historical look back. And um, those are often extremely well attended where people, especially people new to the science, have no idea of why this building is named after someone and what they did. And, and I think that's an incredibly important part of training our young scientists is to appreciate and acknowledge 
those that have gone before them and the contributions that they've made. And um, so it probably is not very well sustained. It doesn't happen enough, in my opinion, but it's an area of great interest of mine. In fact, we're having the centennial of the International Soil Science Society in Florence, Italy uh, next summer. And they're doing a retrospective uh, um, uh, presentations about each of the prominent soil scientists. And, and the one that I'm uh, covering is the first president of the International Soil Science Society. And they're fascinating stories. Immigrants who came to America, uh, very little training, parents bought a farm, they uh, went from being uh, an immigrant who didn't speak the language to, you know, president of a college, you know, ex uh, world known, really leader in their profession. People need to know these stories about how um, scientists helped develop their discipline and the contributions that they made to their profession. Thank you, Tom. I, I, the, the phrase that you said about acknowledging those who had come before, um, something that I can see resonates with all of um, our panelists. Um, I'm under strict instructions to keep us to time, and I notice that we're almost completely out of it. I would just like to conclude by, by thanking uh, Tom, Anne-Marie, and John for really um, thoughtful and stimulating presentations. We filled the rest of the time without any problem whatsoever, and I think that's a compliment um, to your presentation. So thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. And we have to wave. Right? We have thank to you. Wave. Bye. Thank Not you, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye.